my experience has been uh, mostly in the US. I've also worked in the nuclear energy business in Japan and uh, South Africa, but not much in India. You know, India was uh, uh, fairly non-transparent because of the politics, the international politics. The Indian nuclear program was uh, not very, was fairly opaque to outsiders, so I really don't know that much. I follow whatever I see in the media. I'm very interested in what's happening in India. So I'm not going to get too deep into the India specific, but I'll try my best to answer your questions. Uh, is this my slide deck? Uh, looks like it. Okay, it's fine. Uh, feel free to interrupt me anytime if, you have, if, if I'm not clear or you want, uh, you have a question. If you have a more loaded question that's going to take a conversation, please hold it till the end. But if you have any clarity question or a quick question, I'll be happy to take it as we go along. Uh, here is a projection on electricity demand over the next uh, 20 years or so. The yellow line represents the OECD countries. Those are the mostly the developed countries, mostly Europe, Japan, and uh, North America, US, Canada, actually Mexico, Chile, and Israel are part of the OECD now. That's based on Human Development Index and per capita income and a whole bunch of criteria. The yellow is the OECD demand for electricity, and the green is uh, non OECD countries. So this includes China, India, and much of the rest of the world. As you can see, the Demand has been really growing in the last 10 years, quite steep. Uh, the economic growth in these countries is about <clears throat> between zero or in some countries even negative like Greece and other places to maybe 2% at most. These countries have uh, economic GDP growth from between 4% uh, and 10%. And of course China is the leading uh, biggest high growth country in that. India was fairly high till last year. Dropped a little bit, but it's still about 6%, I think, they're expecting in 2013. So the de electricity demand is going to rise like this. And so these countries need to plan on various sources of electricity to, to, to fuel the economy. And uh, the source of this data came from the uh, Energy, uh, Energy Administration and uh, International Outlook and Atomic Energy Agency. Next slide, please. Uh, here are here's the map of the world. The yellow the yellow marks are countries that have nuclear already nuclear programs already. They already have operating reactors and they already have a stable program. Uh, as you can see, India is part of that. As is China. This is all Russia, Western Europe. Uh, this is all of North America. There's a reactor in Mexico. And uh, many reactors in Canada, there's 104 reactors in uh, United States. 20% of the US electricity comes from nuclear plants. And then the red, is the green are emerging reactor, nuclear countries with plant reactors. They don't have a reactor yet, but they are hoping to have them in the near term. And that's all the green. And that includes Turkey and Vietnam and uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, and um, a few other countries here. And have a list of those countries shortly. And then the red are ones that would like to have them. Now, the green is ones that they actually have concrete plans to have reactors. They already have committed vendors or they have started serious planning. The red are uh, hoping to have them. And that includes Chile and uh, Vietnam and a few other places. The gray have no reactors. As you can see in the entire African continent, South Africa is the only country that has nuclear reactors. It has two reactors north of Cape Town. But uh, so, so this is all, this is the Middle East. Now Middle East is changing. So the Saudi government is realizing that the oil that they use to make electricity is worth a lot more on the global market. And that they are talking of building a, in four and eight reactors by 2020. Now they have the money for it. Whether there's a human infrastructure and all the other things that go with it remains to be seen. But uh, the Saudis do have a plan. The guys in Dubai are actually building, in Abu Dhabi are building four reactors. They're building four Korean reactors and actually they have started the site construction already. 
and uh, so there are four reactors build, being built in Abu Dhabi as we speak. I think they will be operational in another four years. Uh, any questions on this slide? As you can see, Iceland, Greenland and Australia do not have any nuclear reactors. Interestingly, the three biggest uranium producers in the world are Australia, Canada and Kazakhstan and none of them have nuclear reactors, but they are, pardon, uh, Canadians do, yeah, you are right, excuse me, uh, but Kazakhstan and uh, Australia do not and they produce about 70 percent of the world's uranium. And the uranium is a commodity market, so it is like any other mineral or material, iron ore or anything else. Any questions on this slide? Okay, thanks. Next slide, please. I just want to show you how increasingly uh, the nuclear business is getting globalized. This is just an example. There are four reactors being, new reactors being built in the US at, at the moment. Uh, two in uh, in Georgia at the Vogel site and two in uh, South Carolina at the VC summer site. As you can see, they are getting parts from Canada, from the US, from Brazil, from the UK, from Spain and uh, Japan uh, and South Korea. So, they are getting a lot of material from many parts of the world and so the global, it is a very, it is a real global industry and uh, US and Canada have a, are fairly self-sufficient in manufacturing sciences, ASME codes and all this other stuff. But as these reactors get built in other countries, they are going to be built, parts are going to come from all over the world. So theoretically, if say Larson and Tubro decided to get into the export business, they could be a major competitor with Japan or South Korea in a lot of fabricated components for nuclear reactors. So there is a potential here from a, from a fabrication manufacturing standpoint as well, not just generating electricity because the global market which I will talk about shortly has a huge demand and uh, right now there is a bottleneck. Uh, Japan is the only one and Korea, South Korea are the only ones who can make very large reactor vessels or very thick forging. So, it is a, I do not know the Indian reactors I assume, I do not know where they come from, maybe they make them in, 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 in India, I am not quite sure about that. But oh, come from probably Japan or South Korea. Yeah, France. Yeah. Right. No. Right. Correct. No, they are what's called a Westinghouse AP1000. That's the latest design. Passive reactors. Yeah, they're very safe. They're the safest design actually in the market. Yeah, that's right. All four are AP1000. And by the way, China is building a whole bunch of AP1000s. Yeah, China has with Westinghouse. It is a brand new design that Westinghouse has that is completely very safe where even if everything fails like what happened in Fukushima, it will not get damaged. It shuts down, it does not need power, it does not need electricity, it is, it, yeah, it uses gravity, it uses natural uh, physics to, to shut the reactor down. So, it is a very advanced, very safe design. Any other questions on this slide? Thank you. Next slide. Uh, I, I just wanted to exp, uh, mention this about US participation in world markets and uh, and why there is, it makes, I am not selling, I do not work for a US company, I work for a non-profit policy institute, but just the, the advantages I, I do want to mention. It is very innovative though. It is the only country that has this AP1000 type of passive reactor design. No other country has it, not, not, not France, not Russia. Uh, it is, it participates in, the, wants to participate in a global market to also achieve non-proliferation goals and safe export practices. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is probably the gold standard for regulation of nuclear design. There are 4,000 scientists and engineers who look at the entire design, the calculations, the thermal hydraulics, every aspect of the nuclear reactor through a microscope. And if they put the stamp of approval, approval it is one of the best stamps of approvals you can get. Right. Correct. Not at a, yeah, I, I would have to check, 
they have done a lot of simulation and small testing and uh, the NRC is come pardon right correct uh, Right. Well, the, what China is going to do is going to be the first country, I think in two more years they are going to operate the AP 1000 and the whole world is watching that and the NRC has people in China studying it uh, as do many other utilities. Talk about bridging nations, there are nuclear regulators from the American government in China observing it, there are uh, operators from the Vogel and other plant I mentioned in America, they are studying how it is being built, what are they learning. So, it is a really a global enterprise. Uh, next slide please. Uh, one thing before I go, the AP 1000, the, uh, they are being manufactured in China, in Japan reactors, but the Chinese are interested in manufacturing it and actually Westinghouse would be probably would be interested in competitive bidding with Larson and Tubro and others as well. So, there is it is a potential even if India does not build an AP 1000, if all the right relationships are established, it may be possible to bid on, on, on building reactors for third countries. Uh, near term opportunities, uh, it says US suppliers, but really it is a global tender. So, really it is not just US. Uh, Poland, Malaysia, Thailand, Brazil, these are all looking at new reactors. Saudi Arabia, Czech Republic, India of course, China, most aggressive and Finland, South Africa, United Kingdom and Vietnam. All of these have bidding processes going on as we speak on different designs and different uh, uh, building new, new plants. Okay. And I did not mention um, uh, the, the actually this slide is slightly outdated, but I will kind of mention the outliers. The Chinese have 26 reactors under construction, 26. They are very aggressive, they are building almost one every year and they have been doing that now for three, uh, one every three months they are starting a new reactor plant and they are very ruthless about it, they are very disciplined. 26 reactors are under construction and 31, uh, 51 are in the planning phase. So, they want to have by 2020, uh, 2030 or something about 80 reactors, they will probably have the world's largest reactor fleet. Currently, United States has 104 reactors, France has 64 reactors and Japan has 54 reactors. So, China will be the number two or number three country very soon within the next five to ten years. So, it is very aggressive program. They want to go away from coal, from thermal to nuclear because of the climate change issues and so on. But they are also building a lot of coal plants at the moment. Uh, Russia is building 11 new reactors and planning 16 more. India has seven um, under construction. This number might have changed a little bit and they are planning 16 more. So, India is actually the third largest planning at least ambition and aspiration wise the third largest country. Uh, Japan has two under construction and they were planning 10, but with Fukushima the politics has changed in Japan and I will talk about that later, but uh, this is probably not credible at the moment. Uh, South Korea has three and six under planning and US is building five, actually it is building four, uh, one of them got cancelled uh, and five more under uh, being planned. And as you see, Pakistan has two under construction and no new reactors planned. And both of them are they are doing with Chinese collaboration. No, it is two plus zero. Yeah, it should be, they are so close together. Two and zero. No new reactors, but two under construction with Chinese help. And then France has one reactor. Now, France has 64 re operating reactors, but they are building one. And then uh, Finland has actually two. And this does not show the Saudi Arabia and the Dubai, Abu Dhabi has four under construction right now. So, this is about a year or two old. So, total, oh, I am sorry, go back to the slide please. 66 under construction and 160 planned or to be ordered. So, that is almost 100 and a staggering amount of megawatts. This is all adds up to like gigawatts, you know, it is a large amount of capacity. Okay, thank you. Next slide please. Now, this I just want to share the global energy supply as of 2009. I did not get the latest slides, but it is probably not changed a whole lot because of economic slowdown globally. Uh, now,
Now this energy, I'm not talking electricity. This is all energy. This is your trucks, your propane for your cooking, uh, yeah, petrol for your cars, heating and air conditioning of buildings. All energy, not just electricity. Primary energy. As you can see, so 27% of the primary energy worldwide is from coal, from thermal plants. 21% uh, approximately from natural gas. And this is all 100, 200 countries in the United Nations. So we're talking of uh, the entire planet here. 32 from petroleum, and renewables is 11%. Nuclear is about 6%, and hydro is 2.3%. Now the next slide. Uh, any questions on this? Geothermal would fall into renewables. And actually, one of the reasons this number is so high is because Iceland. Their entire grid is, most of the grid is running on geothermal. There was so much water, so much steam under under the hot earth. If you, yeah, if you take out New Zealand and uh, Iceland from this, this will drop to 2 or 3 percent. New Zealand and, uh, and, uh, and Iceland are like leaders in that. that, that there is some in U, US as well, in California and other places, but it's very small. Not going to get a thousand megawatt, fifteen hundred megawatt. Yeah, right. 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 Yes, sir. Right. It you might be a different year, it might have changed a little bit from two thousand nine. Yeah, this is this is 2009. Yes, is correct. Correct. Sure. Okay. All right. Uh, so the question was, is nuclear? Uh, you said it's how much? Eight percent. So this is a 2009 uh, statistic and maybe now it's gone up to 8 percent. I don't know. I, 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 when I came, I was in a rush. I was, I'm on vacation here. So I just got whatever I could find. Okay. Uh, next, any other questions on this? Okay. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, no, no, you went. Uh, uh, okay. This is again a 2009 slide, but this is electricity only. I did not include petrol, diesel, propane, all the other stuff, okay? Just electricity, world electricity demand. And here you can see nucleus 13.4%. Uh, now this and then hydro is 16% and renewables is 3%. This is more accurate, you know, because a lot of the, of the you were mentioning about uh, the energy of, of the geothermal. It's really used for heating buildings and things like that. They don't generate electricity with it. What they do is they get hot water from the core of the earth. They circulate it through the entire city to heat all the buildings and they put it back in the thing. It's not electricity. So as soon as electricity generation comes, uh, you can see that the uh, renewables drop significantly. And natural gas is 21% and coal is 40, almost 41%. Now, these dynamics are changing. Uh, and just so you know, nuclear is 13% worldwide. It's 20% in the United States. It's 80% uh, in France, and it's about 35% in Japan, or was before Fukushima. Okay. They're really struggling with that right now. The grid has become very unstable. So it's a huge. It varies from country to country. In India, it's very small. It's only one or two percent, right? Three percent now. Three percent. I think the government wants to raise that up to 15% or something, right? Yeah. Uh, this, this dynamic is changing. What is happening is in America, shale gas, they have found large amounts of shale gas. The shale gas is very cheap to drill and extract from the earth. And the American economic system also is very enticing to make, to make it successful. You know, it's a conversion. So again, I don't want to get into the politics of private sector, public sector, but the shale gas is on people's private property, and when you, if you find a shale gas in your in your in your farm, it's like hitting a lottery ticket. 
because the oil company to extract the shale gas will pay you money. And so, suddenly you are a farmer and suddenly uh, you have tremendous incentive to cooperate with the shale gas company. In countries which are more socialistic, all the resources are owned by the government. So, if you are a farmer, you say you grow mangoes here and you find shale gas under your, in your mango plantation, you have no incentive to cooperate because the government will take that shale gas and sell it in Delhi and you are just sitting there with a lot of holes in your, in your farm. In, in America, the farmer has a lot of incentive to cooperate with shale gas drilling. So, so there is a convergence of private interests and oil, in, oil company interests and everything else. And that is the reason shale gas has not, although they have found huge amounts of shale gas in China and Europe and probably in India also. But the economic mechanism to encourage people to cooperate and provide their private land is uh, does not exist. So, just as aside, uh, not nothing to do with nuclear, but just thought I would mention that. So, this shale, this natural gas production is going to go from 21 percent to 30 or 40 percent over the next several years. Uh, hydro is saturated. I think there is not, you know, as we found with Narmada Valley and so on, there is a limit because of the disruption of whole villages and towns. It is not easy to build a lot of hydroelectric plants. I think they are saturated in most of the world. So, this is not going to go, this is likely to go down, although it is a wonderful renewable resource plus water shortages and the water climate change, all this is going to play a big role in the hydro. But natural gas is going to grow, coal is going to shrink in developed countries because of pollution. It is probably going to continue to increase in India and China, at least for the next 10, 15 years. Uh, any questions on this? Thanks. Uh, this is a, a correlation between per capita consumption of electricity and uh, what is called the Human Development Index, which is developed by the United Nations. So, the United Nations, I think it is United Nations or OECD, I am not sure, but they take uh, per capita income of the country, they take uh, electricity consumption, they take education levels, they take a lot of different factors and they create a human uh, index for the whole country. And there are four groupings of this development. One is very high, which is this light blue, uh, blue color. The red is high, yellow is medium, and uh, low human development is green. And uh, as you can see, India used to be here uh, in 1880s and 90s. It has moved up here, and China has moved up here. As you can see, Iceland, Norway, these are all uh, mostly developed countries. And there is this whole bunch of red countries which are East Europe and other places that are gradually moving into a, into a higher human. But what this shows is it, it shows the, uh, the human development index plotted against the uh, uh, use of electricity. The use of electricity is a very good index to measure how much progress the uh, society is making. And so this shows low levels of consumption here in this band of countries and this band of countries is much higher. Now, obviously, some of these countries need all that electricity for heating and all their high winter, winter countries and so on. But overall, uh, this is a very good index that tells you how uh, the development of a country and the consumption of electricity, how they correlate to each other. So, I just thought this slide might be worth looking at. Right. But there are lots of curves. Correct, correct. I agree. There actually, there are a lot of other curves. You know, I'm a big metrics guy because you know they say what you can't measure, you can't improve. So unless you can measure, you can't really improve it. Thanks. Next slide, please. Uh, here's the nuclear generation worldwide. Um, it's currently there's 373 gigawatts of nuclear, and in, um, in, in 2010 it was two, uh, 373 gigawatts. That's a large amount of electricity. Most of it is in US, France and Japan and also Germany and other places, but those are three big players. And South Korea and Taiwan also have a lot of nuclear, their grid also is like 30, 20, 25, 30 percent nuclear. Here is a projection for 2020, they expect to have 445 reactors operational and uh, this, this is the low uh, uh, pessimistic scenario, this is the optimistic scenario. So, the gr green band shows the range of uh, pessimistic and optimistic. Gigawatts, I am sorry, gigawatts, gigawatts. And here is uh, for 2030 from 
and a lot of this is uh, China and hopefully India, yeah, but China for sure. China is very determined about building a large number of plants, but it does show the optimistic and pessimistic brackets for gigawatts. Yes, sir. Right. Uh huh. Not really. The only thing that has come down in that's only because of Japan. Japan has 54 reactors and after Fukushima they panicked and shut down all 54 reactors. That's what brought it down from March of 2011 till now. Yeah, not stopped. They're going to decommission by 2020. But then Finland is building new plants and the Czech Republic is building new plants and right. And also you have to remember Germany is ta shutting, talking of shutting down nuclear plants in Germany, but they are part of the European grid and they are going to buy all the electricity from France which is all 80 percent nuclear. So, they are going to buy nuclear electricity from France. Yeah, anyway. Yeah. yeah. And also in, in politics you never know. They say they'll shut it down. Like for example, Sweden, I'll give you a good example. Sweden has six nuclear plants. About 10 years back, they had a very liberal party that said we're going to shut down everything. When they did the calculation, they found they'll be in third world conditions for the grid. So then they said maybe we'll run for 10 more years. Now they are saying we are very comfortable, we're going to operate long term. So if the politics can determine, tomorrow the new election in Germany, they may change their mind. In fact, in Japan, yesterday a political party won which is very pro-nuclear. So it's very going to very interesting to see how it develops. You know, there, there was an anti-nuclear party running uh, LDJ or whatever. L L LDP won the election, but the uh, DPJ, they were uh, they on their watch. Fukushima happened, so they used it to shut down the whole country's nuclear program. But now the new party won with a two-thirds majority. It will be very interesting to see what happens in Japan. So you might see this number climbing again because of Japan, but it may be six months or a year. Any other questions here? Uh, am I, I want to make sure I'm communicating clear. Yeah, you can hear me at the back. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to give you a quick uh, snapshot of U.S. public opinion about nuclear energy because it will give you a, in the U.S. being uh, both a very loud democracy and a noisy democracy like India, they do a lot of polling. They try to find out what people are thinking and so on. So we do these polls every six months. So. Uh, this is post Fukushima, so you know exactly what impact Fukushima had on the American public opinion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is we have been these in the U.S. They have been doing this public opinion polls for 29 years. So we have a long history of what is the public thinking, how many are pro-nuclear, how many are anti-nuclear, what are their concerns, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the latest one was taken in September, just about three months ago, and they keep calling about a thousand people at random. Um, they also poll people who live close to nuclear plants and people who live in other parts of the country. So, it's a very cross section of the uh, population. And there's a margin of error of plus or minus three points. And this particular thing was done by a company called Bisconti Research. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So, here this green shows people who are favoring nuclear and the yellow shows people who are against nuclear. And here is where the Fukushima accident happened in March of 2011. And you can see this big dip was because of Fukushima. So, it was the first emo emotional reaction to nuclear. But as you can see in both country, in both uh, uh, the opposition has dropped and the people who support nuclear has gone up to about 65 percent. So, two in three Americans feel that nuclear is a risk worth taking, that it is valuable and it is a risk that you can live with like you flying in an airplane or anything else. There is no zero risk, but it is a risk worth taking and it is good for the country. And 30, uh, the uh, people who are opposed to nuclear has dropped from 33 to 29 percent. So, roughly one in three is ambivalent about nuclear power. I do not I don't know whether they take such polls in India, but uh, it is a good way of uh, NPCL or the DAE or whoever knowing what, what is the public thinking in different parts of the country. Especially with cell phone technology, it should be fairly easy to do. Next slide, please. 
uh, okay in america typically uh, this is a technical buzzword that i'll explain in america when the license a reactor the nuclear regulatory commission gives a 40 year license so the plant operates for 40 years at 40 years the person the company that owns the nuclear reactor can apply for a license renewal that's what's meant by the renew the license and for a 20 year period so they can go back and say we want to operate this reactor for 60 years then the nrc looks at the technical uh, radiation uh, issues with metal and uh, uh, big components and the corrosion of the plant concrete in the plant they inspect everything and if, if they deem that the plant is safe to operate they give another 20 years so people who are asked is it a good idea to renew a license and 81 percent said yes 81 percent because the nice advantage of this is without building a new plant you're adding 20 years of uh, reactor operation to the uh, ability to generate electricity um, this is for new build they asked if you are are you prepared to to build new plants if needed in the next 10 years and 74 percent said yes and definitely build more was a lower number of 60 percent so clearly in America there is a consensus, it is not unanimous as I said there is one third who, who will never agree with you but two thirds feel that it makes sense. Next slide please. Uh, this is more statistics and again it shows the variation and these are, these are polls taken every three to six months and uh, the green is the renewal of licenses, uh, this is building of new plants and this is definitely building new plants and as you can see that is a lower number. So again, you can see that it is a fairly high consensus among the people that it makes sense to build. Right. I do not know, that is a good question. What Prakash is asking is, does anybody have a sense for public opinion in India at Jaitapur or Kudakulam, right? Yeah. Right. Right. No, when opposition, you mean that there's a bunch of people who show up and complain. I'm not talking of that. If you took a cross section of the people, right. Right. What about uh, what about what about public education on nuclear? Like you know, in America, every state, every the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, every nuclear company, they collect third-party statistics from IAEA or whatever about uh, radiation hazards and uh, compare how much radiation you get from your dentist or from sitting in an airplane to from here to Delhi versus get, getting it from a nuclear plant. And sort of like an outreach, public education and outreach program. Right. Might be value. Yeah. But uh, there is a real need to educate the public. The public doesn't know much about radiation, and they they don't realize that their bodies are getting radiation every day from outer space, from their dentist, by sitting in an airplane, from the walls of their houses. The brick and concrete has has a radon gas in it, so you get radiation from Mother Nature all the time. Our bodies have adjusted to that.
lain. Oh yeah, correct. You will never get total unanimity, you know. Yeah, that is something that has to be worked, and that but it needs to be listened to. If somebody has an issue, you need to listen to it. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, again, here is uh, more statistics on uh, renewing license. I think we looked at this, didn't we? Yeah, I think you went in the wrong direction. No? Yeah, next slide. Yeah. Uh, acceptability of a new reactor at the nearest nuclear plant site. As you can see, 70 percent of the people who live near, near a reactor are very comfortable with it in America because they have lived with it for 20, 30 years. They get tax benefits, they get uh, gyms, swimming pools, everything paid for by the uh, nuclear plant and they have never seen any problem and they have no health issues. So, 70 percent of people in the neighborhood of a nuclear plant find it very acceptable. Only 26 percent have issues. Again, they are weighing, they are not clear why they are against it. Next slide please. And perceived safety of nuclear plants, again you can see the dip after Fukushima and it has come back to almost 70 percent and the antis are around 17 percent. And it is very important for these public opinion surveys and transparency, it is very important for confidence, public confidence. Public confidence is a very important thing whether it is sitting in an airplane or sitting or, or, or living near a reactor or even allowing someone to build a reactor, public has to generally be confident that it is safe and it does not disrupt their life. Next. And, um, here is again perception of safety, 76 percent agree it is pretty safe, uh, strongly agree it is broken, it is gra graded and you will generally see, you can look at this at your leisure, but it will pro are you posting this on your website? Yeah. So, so you, you have uh, some disagreement, but generally people are in America anyway are very comfortable with nuclear power, even after Fukushima. Yeah, this is uh, again a very Fukushima specific questions that were asked in the surveys and again it has recovered in September, it is back to 80, around 80 percent. Next slide. And here is what are the different benefits of nuclear energy and uh, reliable electricity, clean air, energy independence from the Middle East, affordable electricity, efficiency, job creation, economic growth and climate change solution. And th these are the percentages that they say a lot and these say a little. So, you know as you see if you add up these two, there is significant public support even today. What is, it, there's, at one time they were talking about building 20 reactors in the US about a, a few years back. That has come down, the expectation is down mainly because of shale. Shale gas produces less carbon and is so that it is going to be difficult to justify large capital investments in nuclear plants. That is the reason it has come down to four reactors instead of. Yeah, that is probably what it is. Yeah. Okay. I think that is probably the last slide I think, right. Is, is there another slide? Okay, that's it. Yeah, I think we saw that one. Okay. 
you know, in the history of nuclear power, out of the 440 reactors that have operated for last 30 years, there have been only three accidents, three serious accidents. There have been minor issues here and there, but it's, there's so much defense and depth, so many safety systems that it has never been a threat. But the three accidents was Three Mile Island in 1979, Chernobyl in 1984, and now Fukushima. That's the only time there have been severe accidents. Three Mile Island, the entire radiation was contained inside the containment. So nobody, even people who lived right outside the plant did not experience any radiation from that. The plant was destroyed. That particular plant, they could not re restart it. So the company lost a lot of money, but nobody was injured. But there was a big lessons learned. There was a big government commission called the Kenemi Commission that investigated for three years on why it happened, how it happened. And out of that came uh, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations in Atlanta and uh, simulators with high fidelity. But the simulator is exactly like the nuclear plant. So the operators train on it every six weeks. A lot of training programs, sharing of information between different nuclear plants all around the world. All those lessons learned came from Three Mile Island. Now one of the things, for example, not far from Three Mile Island, there's a, another reactor called Beaver Valley. And they had a very similar incident to Three Mile Island three months before Three Mile Island. But the operators were able to understand and save the plant. Nothing happened. But because there was no information sharing of experience from different plants, there wasn't a platform. That was one of the lessons of Three Mile Island. That nuclear plants have to, just like pilots and airlines, have to constantly share what mistakes did somebody do or what can we learn from this. So those are some of the big things, but nobody was hurt and nobody was injured. Chernobyl in 1984 was a Russian design called a v, uh, I think RBMK, which is a very quite an unsafe design. It doesn't have a containment. It has a graphite core, and uh, Russia, it has something called positive reactivity. So when things go start going wrong, in most light water reactors, the, uh, automatically the plant shuts down. The reaction reactivity becomes less and less. The Russian design, it got more and more. So it was a very poor design. I don't know why the Russians came up with it, because they were operating in secrecy in the Soviet Union. So they came up with that design, and they had a disastrous ex experience, explosion of the reactor. They contaminated large parts of Ukraine. I think about 30 firefighters and operators died in, the, uh, in, in trying to control the situation. But that was not really relevant for the most of the world. Because nobody else has RBMK. I think there's one or two in Romania or Bulgaria or something, and they're shutting them down. So really, it was a non-issue. Now, Fukushima is a little bit different. Fukushima is a standard light water reactor. And for the last year and a half, I've been studying why it happened, what could we learn from it, and that sort of thing. And that's what there are some lessons learned for the global industry and some lessons that are very Japan-specific. One of the Japan-specific things, in my view, is that Japan is uh, sitting on four tectonic plates. You know, the Earth's surface is broken up into like a jigsaw puzzle. Each tectonic plate is rubbing against another tectonic plate. Now, countries that are on a one tectonic plate are very stable. The earthquakes and tsunamis are much less likely, almost very low probability. Japan is sitting on four tectonic plates, and they're constantly rubbing against each other. And I don't know, let me do a quiz here, quick, from just how many earthquakes do you think Japan had last year? Can anyone take a guess? Anybody else take a guess? Last year, any quake that's measurable on a seismograph? Okay, you say 150. How about you guys? Can anyone, anyone take a guess? It's much higher than that. Anyone take a guess? 18,000 earthquakes last year in Japan. 18,000. Japan is very unique. The whole Pacific Ocean is very unique, and Japan is the most unique because it's sitting on four. It's like a shaker table where these islands are constantly rubbing against each other, and it's a very dangerous place from an earthquake standpoint. But their technology to design for those earthquakes is very good. I've been to Japan 14 times. I've experienced three earthquakes. 14 random business trips, three earthquakes. One of them was so severe, 4 o'clock in the morning, my laptop was rattling, my TV was going like that. I'm on the 18th floor of a hotel. And I was wondering whether I would survive it. And I called the front desk and I said, oh, don't worry. We are used to this. So their nuclear plants, their chemical plant, their railway, their high-speed bullet trains, they're very advanced and they're really designed for these earthquakes. 
Now, Fukushima, what happened was they had a huge tsunami, and you may have seen it on television 60, uh, 48 foot high tsunami. And uh, they really didn't bank on that. And so the water came into the power plant and it broke through the doors and went and took out some of the very critical electric safety systems. Now, if they had hardened the building for water ingestion and they had, they had planned for something like this, it wouldn't have been a problem. Just to explain why it's not automatically a danger, just north of Fukushima, there's a plant called Onagawa. If you Google Onagawa, you'll see it. It, is, it was closer to the epicenter. It had a bigger earthquake than Fukushima. It had a bigger tsunami than Fukushima. But it was located on a, like a cliff. And nothing happened. And the earthquake, although it was very severe, very severe, that earthquake was 9.0 on the Richter scale, which is incredibly, that is a, you know, if that happened in Mumbai, the whole city will be one flat pile of concrete, that type of earthquake. It won't happen because we don't have a tectonic plate here lying along the border. Pardon? Right. So the water ingestion destroyed Fukushima's critical safety systems, whereas the Onagawa, which was at a higher altitude, nothing happened and the plants safely shut down and all the neighborhood of Onagawa was wiped out. All the villages and towns, 10,000 people dead. All the houses wiped out, all the highways wiped out. The people in those villages and towns lived in the nuclear plant for three months. The utility said, come and stay. They had a big auditorium and big office buildings. They said, we'll get sleeping bags and you can stay here. We'll figure out how to feed you and everything. So all the neighboring around Onagawa, all those villagers lived in the nuclear plant for three months. But media has not really picked on that. They focused only on Fukushima. But Onagawa had a bigger earthquake, bigger tsunami, and it was closer to the epicenter of the earthquake. So it's not, shouldn't, people shouldn't assume that right away it's unsafe. Actually, the Japanese design for earthquake is very good. They underestimated the tsunami. Yes, sir. Right. Right. Well, Arivas. Arriva has 64 reactors in France as well as other reactors and it's very, it's a, actually a licensed technology from Westinghouse. So it's really more than just Arriva technology. But the new EPR that they're proposing for Jaitapur, that's the latest technology. It is supposed to be much safer, much safer. But the experience with it, so far they're building two in China and two in Finland and, and they're building one in France. There isn't like a rock solid experience, but because of their 50 years or so of 30 years of operating experience, they claim that all the improvements are in this design. Right. Right. Actually, it's much. It's quite improved. You know, for example, I understand if an airplane, if an airplane crashed into it, nothing will happen to it. Yeah. Ah, right. So I'm not that familiar with the EPR design because there's none in America. And NRC hasn't licensed the EPR design in America, but the, the French have a lot of competence and a lot of experience. So I, I'm not going to say it's. I, I know Chinese are building two, so they must be confident. The Finns are building two. So, in fact, the Chinese one will be operating in a couple of years, so you could go and actually inspect it and check it out. Thousand to fifteen hundred is a good economy, but um, it also depends on the size of the grid. Like if you build a 1000 megawatt or 2000 megawatt, say two units of 1500 each and 3000 megawatt, you, if you don't have the grid to handle that power, it's a waste, right? You can't really move that power anywhere. So you, you can't just look at a nuclear plant in isolation. You have to look at the transmission system and all the other things. Pardon? The grid should be there. And some, that also is a very political issue because grid goes through people's farms and everything and
Pardon? You could, but if it is a proven technology that is being built worldwide, it is better to go there and visit those places and learn from it. Well, Kodak column is a Russian design, I am not very familiar with that design. Russia. Uh, mega megawatt. Right. Finance cost of that? I don't know. I have not. Uh, it it will be in the billions. I don't know uh, what. Pardon? Thanks. Sure. Right. In my opinion, it's an observation. Right. Okay. Right. But I have a question. Right. After 1979 came I accident. Right. For at least 25 years, the right. brand was being considered. But why? Right. That is not true. Because for 20, for 25 years. Yeah. Now it's a current renaissance in the last few years. Correct. Correct. That's why it is just that I Thank you. My car. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Any energy is a trade off. Correct. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. Really can't. But in India, as you said, they are only planning to have super chips because by the time they build all these things. Right. Right. I agree. I think the only real country that's going to build in really large numbers is China. They have uh, the political will and the ability to cut where they build high speed railways, anything they seem to apply their mind, they cut through it and do it. No other country has that capacity. Especially democracy is very tough.